the president.
Questions. Question one, Ms. Alice Mack. President, in recent years, a lot of people have solicited donations from the public through online platforms, online crowdfunding, for supporting charity, funding litigations, and even sponsoring activities that undermine the interests of Hong Kong, say, for example, mutually destructive acts such as urging authorities of foreign countries to impose sanctions in Hong Kong, as well as making preparation for liberating Hong Kong. Furthermore, some online crowdfunding initiatives were arrested for suspected fraud, that is, misappropriation of funds raised through crowdfunding, money laundering, etc. While well, application for a permit from the authorities is currently required for conducting fundraising activities at public places, online crowdfunding is not regulated, thereby giving op opportunities to take advantage of the loopholes. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, whether it knows how overseas countries regulate online crowdfunding activities and platforms in order to curb illegal activities, two, whether it will enact legislation to provide for online crowdfunding on matters such as applications, vetting and approval of these applications, permitted fundraising purposes and limits on the amounts raised, as well as the sources, users, movements of donations, so as to prevent the funds raised from being used for supporting violent and illegal activities and to prevent lawmakers from committing money laundering, lawbreakers from committing money laundering, fraud and other unlawful acts in the name of crowdfunding and free whether online crowdfunding using servers overseas for raising funds to be used in Hong Kong is regulated by law. If so, of the details, if not, whether it was a study regulating such activities. Secretary for our financial services and the Treasury. President, the rapid development of internet and social media crowdfunding activities have become increasingly prevalent internationally and locally for past few years. According to a paper published by the IOSCO International Organization of Securities Commissions, crowdfunding typically refers to the use of small amounts of money obtained from a large number of individuals to fund a project to a business or personal loan or other needs through the web. Main types of crowdfunding that are regulated to financial services typically involve equity crowdfunding, meaning that investors invest in a project or a business, which is usually a startup through the online platform in return for future interests or profits. In addition, these funding can also be used for peer-to-peer -peer lending, P2P lending, meaning that investors participate in the funding activity as lenders, and the online platform matches lenders with borrowers to provide unsecured loan in return for interests. However, there are others who use crowdfunding as the means to achieve purposes other than for financial services, such as for charitable purpose through online platforms or receive physical goods or services through pre-sale. In consultation with the companies, registries, SFC, Securities and Futures Commis Commission and the police, our reply to Ms. Mike's question is as follows. Regarding parts one and two, depending on the purpose and nature of the activities, they are under the ambit of relevant existing regulations. For example, if it involves an offer to the public to purchase securities, they may be subject to the Securities and Futures Ordinance SFO and the company's winding up and miscellaneous provisions ordinance. A document offering shares in or debentures of a company to the public is subject to registration requirements under the uh, company's um, winding up and miscellaneous provisions ordinance unless an exemption applies. Where an exemption applies to an offer of investment such as where the offer is only made to professional investors, these platform operators may still subject to SFC's licensing requirements if it's an investment-based funding. On the other hand, if there is a lending element in the activity, the provisions under the money lenders ordinance may apply. Under this ordinance, the term money lender means every person whose business is that of making loans or who advertises or announces himself or holds himself out in any way as carrying on that business. A money lender is required to hold the license unless the loans are exempted under the ordinance. The above requirements are equally applicable to physical companies or online lending businesses. Apart from obtaining a money lender license, the crowdfunding lending platform must also comply with the requirements under the ordinance and the licensing conditions, which include requirements on the information to be set out in the loan agreement, the borrower's right to information, advertisement, presentation of interest rates, etc. Whether it's online or held in public places, if the crowdfunding activities involve money laundering, fraud and other unlawful acts, 
The police will investigate and prosecute in accordance with existing laws and regulations. We note. Well, Ms. Mack asked about the situation overseas. We note that while regulations on crowdfunding activities and platforms in overseas countries and regions vary, the relevant regulatory requirements are generally based on the nature of the activity, whether it involves equity trading, rather than only targeting the means of funding, for example, online or offline. We will continue to monitor and make reference to the latest development overseas. In relation to part three of the question, the existing regulations on crowdfunding activities in Hong Kong may be applicable to overseas online platforms that raise funds for use in Hong Kong. As I mentioned in parts one and two, these re regulations include the SFO, the companies winding up miscellaneous provision ordinance and the money lenders ordinance. For instance, in relation to equity crowdfunding, if the SFC receives complaints, they will check whether these overseas crowdfunding operators target, targeting Hong Kong public have conducted any regulated activities in Hong Kong without a license or offered investments to the public of Hong Kong without the SFC's authorization. If the lending activities on the overseas crowdfunding platforms constitute the making of a loan by a money lender in Hong Kong under the MLO, the Money Lenders Ordinance, the regulatory regime of the ordinance would apply. Thank you. Ms. Alice Mack. Mr. Jeremy Tam, I have a point of order. I noticed that just now, in the secretary's reply, he did not read word by word the um, from the script. In the past, if members have not done so, then uh, you will stop him. I noticed that he has added um, bonds in his reply, but it hasn't appeared in the script. Please clarify, in the future, can we do the same? The question provided from legislators will have to be read out word by word. The Secretary's reply to be uploaded online in the future uh, will be the verbatim record of the Secretary's reply. Well, it's already printed on the um, document that it is subject to uh, actual answer given in the council meeting. Ms. Mack. Mr. Tan, I'd like to get a confirmation. If members read out their question for oral ans answer, we'll have to read out word by word, but that doesn't apply to secretaries. Right. As you can see, there is a chop there, and, it's, and it says so already. So that's always been the convention, Ms. Mack. I think, President, you need to maybe organize a tutorial. Hong Kong is an international financial center. There should be stringent anti-money laundering regulations. But now we can see that if you chant a political slogan, then you can uh, conduct crowdfunding not subject to any regulations. There are some uh, organizations that has raised one fifteen million dollars uh, for taking out advertisements overseas. They have done so a number of times and disappeared. There are also some delegations that have uh, raised three million dollars after a press conference. They disappeared. There is also a well-known case, the um, Spark Alliance. They said that uh, there is no fiscal no. Uh, fiscal report, no um, transparency whatsoever. So there is no regulation whatsoever in relation to these crowdfunding activities. Does it involve money laundering? Um, well, have you regulated these activities or will you plan to do so? But that's not my question. Well, just now I said that if you chant a political slogan, then you can conduct crowdfunding, especially with the use of overseas online platforms. Well, with the uh, security national law. If people chant liberating Hong Kong, then they have committed um, offenses relating to uh, subverting um, state power, etc. But they will make use of overseas online platforms for their crowdfunding. Does it constitute uh, colluding with uh, external forces? Who is going to be the enforcer? The SFTB or the uh, Security Bureau? 
who is going to answer? Under Secretary for Security. Thank you. At this moment, uh, there is no actual details of the national security law. We are unable to comment on the law. Ms. Mack mentioned about frauds or money laundering activities. I'd like to point out that online crowdfunding activities always carry a risk of fraud or money laundering. If the provisions in the law prohibits such acts. Specifically, there will be sanctions. In relation to cases in the past, the police have arrested relevant parties for suspected to organize fundraising online to support certain activities. Upon investigation, they found elements of money laundering or fraud. The accounts have been frozen. Mr. Wong Kok Kin, President, it is well known that in relation to national security law, there are very stringent regulations in relation to funds coming from unknown sources. For the mutually dis uh, destructive um, camps, they want to raise funds to support violent activities or even ask authorities from overseas countries to sanction Hong Kong. Would you ask the Hong Kong Monetary Authority or banks to tighten um, the vetting of bank accounts being used as crowdfunding to make sure that they will not be used for in activities that might uh, undermine Hong Kong's interests or uh, are involved in illegal activities? There are two perspectives. I first like to talk about uh, the banking sector. We already have mechanisms in place to ensure that uh, the bank will follow very uh, strictly the procedures involved. If the crowdfunding activities is not for financial um, services, if it involves existing regulation, then there will be laws uh, to regulate them and there will be penalties. Mr. Chen Kim Po, well, the Secretary in his reply made it very clear that if it involves uh, loans, lending or uh, financial activities, then there will be laws to regulate them. For banks, if they can prove that um, it is used uh, for illegal activities or the source is unknown, then the account will be frozen, but the money has already been raised. Do you have any ways to ensure that uh, there won't be any gray area for the activities uh, to uh, take advantage of before you freeze their accounts? I thank Mr. Chen for the question. Well, of course, uh, if it involves um, the financial sector, then one will open an account. There will be some know your client procedures. And so they get a uh, an understanding of the background of the account holder. But if the activity contravenes certain laws, um, I have already mentioned three, the Securities and Futures Ordinance, Companies Ordinance, as well as the Money lending, uh, money Lenders Ordinance. Uh, the uh, applicable laws will be, will be triggered. Mr. Edward Lau. Well, there are regulations uh, overseas on online um, crowdfunding, but in Hong Kong, there is no such regulations or laws. There is one from the Social Welfare Department. It is a good practice for fundraising. Will you consider improving the regulatory regime? And would you consider expanding the scope covered by the SWD uh, fund, charitable fundraising to regulate online crowdfunding activities? I thank Mr. Lau for the question. Well, you mentioned crowdfunding, but there may be uh, different uh, purposes. 
financial services or non-financial purposes. Charitable fundraising is one of them. It's under the purview of uh, the SWD as well as the Home Affairs Bureau. I will forward members' question to the relevant departments and bureaus, and I will share with you their answers when I get them. Mr. Jimmy Ng. Apart from online crowdfunding, I see that uh, there are a lot of collection boxes in the street. Of course, uh, there is the Summary uh, Offences Ordinance, CAP 288, under which uh, permits may be issued. There may be some organizations with dubious backgrounds, and I see the number of such organizations have has mushroomed, have the our government looked into the nature and background of these organizations and would they consider regulating such uh, um, on-street fundraising activities? Yes, uh, there is the Summary Offences Ordinance on uh, Cap 288 in relation a uh, 228 in relation to um, well, selling of uh, flags or uh, badges uh, for fundraising purpose, a permit is required. So in relation to these uh, on-street acti fundraising activities, uh, there are laws regulating them. Mr. Ma Fung Kwok. Well, you mentioned about charitable uh, fundraising activities. It involves the use of the internet. Will there be any regulation whatsoever? In the past year, well, from the start of the anti extradition bill movement to now, does the administration know about the number of illegal activities using online crowdfunding activities to raise funds? Secretary, Under Secretary for Security, thank you. If it involves online crowdfunding activities, if there are illegal activities involved, say money laundering, fraud, or uh, financing terrorist activities, they're all regulated under existing laws. We have the uh, organized crime, uh, organized and serious crimes ordinance relating and um, Drugs. Uh, we have the um, um, reg we have the laws uh, to reclaim the drug proceeds. If there is a misappropriation of funds, then there is the theft ordinance. If it's fraud, then there is uh, the offence of fraud or deception. If the purpose of the fundraising activity deviates uh, from its purpose. There are already laws covering them. Mr. Ma mentioned about regulation on online fundraising activities. Under CAP 228 Section 4, it talks about uh, fundraising activities in public places or uh, fundraising by charitable organizations as well as uh, selling of souvenirs in public places. Permit can be obtained from the FEHD, the Food and Environmental Hygiene Department. For other activities, if there is no crime element involved, there is no laws to regulate them. What hasn't been answered, Mr. Ma? Do they have any figures? How many of the how many of these illegal activities are there in the past year? We have not. Uh, the police have not kept a record. Mr. Stephen Ho. Well, I have heard the replies of from the two from the secretary and the under secretary. I'd like to follow up on Mr. Ng's question. The two officials have been uh, reading out um, the the laws and the penalties that are uh, asking us uh, to follow the rules. Well, currently, you will still find. Uh, the identity of the operators online, and you can freeze their accounts and block their uh, online accounts. But what about collection boxes at the street? 
theoretically, you have to op obtain a permit from the um, Home Affairs Department under CAP 228. But then Mr. Hui said that uh, CAP 228 also regulate charitable organizations. But there are a lot of uh, dubious politicians. Well, they said that uh, if uh, these uh, crowdfunding activities involves uh, fraud, money laundering, and other unlawful acts, the police will investigate and enforce the law. But what about um, fraud relating to a political purpose? If you operate under the flag of a political party, then no one is there to enforce the law. How will you uh, ask your departments to prevent um, the occasions when these um, uh, when these dubious politicians and uh, po uh, political organizations and parties from s milking innocent uh, citizens dry. We noticed that uh, during um, public order event activities, there are collection boxes and fundraising activities. When police officers conduct their patrol, they would um, make a record. And if there are, if the law is broken, they will collect evidence. If there is sufficient evidence, prosecution will be initiated. There has been actions taken. Whether um, a decision is made on the spot is uh, for the police to decide. What hasn't been answered? Mr. Ao said that they will collect evidence, but usually it's just obstruction. But now it's a cap two two eight. You can't enforce the law on street. I know that there has been some online crowdfunding activities. You have taken actions, but what about on street ones? Anything to add? The police will collect evidence on the spot and at the scene. Depending on the sufficiency of the evidence, they will investigate. They will follow up and take action accordingly. For collection boxes, they form part of the evidence. Zhong Yu. Second question, Tanya Chen. Article 18 of the Basic Law stipulates that the laws listed in Annex 3 shall be applied locally by way of promulgation or legislation by the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region or the SAR. The Standing Committee of the National People's Congress or NPCSC may add or may add to or delete from the list of laws in Annex 3 after consulting its committee for the basic law of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region or the BLC and the SAR government. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, whether it knows the specific criteria or legal provisions based on which NPCSC determines whether a certain piece of national law shall be applied in SA, in the SAR by way of promulgation or by way of legislation, whether under the SAR legal system there is a difference in the status of the laws applied by the two different ways mentioned above, two, whether it knows the procedure adopted by NPCSC for consulting the BLC and the SAR government in respect of the addition to or deletion from the list of laws in Annex 3 to the Basic Law, including the stage at which the consultation is to take place, whether such a consultation procedure is also applicable to the amendments made to the provisions of the laws listed in Annex 3 and 3. As the SAR government indicated in this reply to a question raised by a member of this council in February 1999 that in future, if any national law proposed to be added to Annex 3 to the basic law has any practical effect in the SAR, we will refer the issue concerned to the relevant Legislative Council panel for discussion whether the SAR government still adopts such a practice at present. Um, Secretary for, Con for Constitutional and Mainland Affairs. Mr. President, uh, on the question asked uh, by Ms. Tanya Chen, having consulted uh, the relevant bureau and department, our consolidated reply is as follows. The National People's Congress, or the NPC, is the highest state organ of power of the People's Republic of China. In accordance 
with Article 62 of the Constitution of the People's Republic of China or the Constitution, the NPC exercises the function and power of enacting and amending laws. The Hong Kong Special Administrative Region or the HKSAR was established by the decision of the National People's Congress on the establishment of the HKSAR adopted in accordance with Article 31 of the Constitution on the 4th of April 1990. The NPC adopted the basic law of the HKSAR of the People's Republic of China as a national law in accordance with Articles 31 and 62, 14 of the Constitution. Article 2 of the Basic Law stipulates that the NPC authorizes the HKSAR to exercise a high degree of autonomy and enjoy executive, legislative and independent judicial power including that of final adjudication in accordance with the provisions of the Basic Law. Article 18 of the Basic Law stipulates that national laws shall not be applied in the HKSAR except for those listed in Annex 3 to the Basic Law. The laws listed therein shall be applied locally by way of promulgation or legislation by the HKSAR. The Standing Committee of the National People's Congress or NPCSC may add to or delete from the list of laws in Annex 3 after consulting its Committee for the Basic Law or the BLC of the HASAR and the Government of the HASAR. Laws listed in Annex 3 to the Basic Law shall be confined to those relating to defence and foreign affairs as well as other matters outside the limits of the autonomy of the HKSAR as specified by the Basic Law. Article 13 of the Basic Law stipulates that the Central People's Government or the CPG shall be responsible for the foreign affairs relating to the HKSAR, whereas Article 14 of the Basic Law stipulates that the, Cent the CPG shall be responsible for the defence of the HKSAR. These are examples of matters outside the limits of the autonomy of the HKSAR. In accordance with the Basic Law, the HKSAR exercises a high degree of autonomy in, any, in many areas, especially with, re with respect to the economy. Various provisions in Chapter 5 of the Basic Law provide for the high degree of autonomy of the HKSAR in public finance, monetary affairs, trade, industry and commerce. The most representative ones include Article 108 of the Basic Law, which stipulates that the HASAR shall practice an independent taxation system, Article 111, which stipulates that the Hong Kong dollar, as the legal tender in the HKSAR, shall continue to circulate, and Article 114, which stipulates that the HKSAR shall maintain the status of a free port. So these are clearly matters within the limits of the autonomy of the HASAR. Since Hong Kong's return to the motherland, the NPCSC has made additions to and deletion from the list of national laws listed in Annex 3 to the Basic Law four times, including one on the 1st of um, July 1997, adding the law of the People's Republic of China on the national flag, the regulations of the People's Republic of China concerning consular privileges and immunities, the law of the People's Republic of China on the national emblem, the law of the People's Republic of China on the territorial sea and the contiguous zone, and the law of the People's Republic of China on the garrison of the HKSAR, as well as deleting the order on the national emblem of the People's Republic of China proclaimed by the CPG, attach a design of the national emblem, notes of explanation and instructions were used to adding the law of the People's Republic of China on the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf on the 4th of November 1998, 3. Adding the law of the People's Republic of China on judicial immunity from compulsory measures concerning the property of foreign central banks on the 27th of October 2005. And 4. Adding the law of the People's Republic of China on the national emblem on the 4th of November 2017. The NPCSC may add to or delete from the list of laws in Annex 3 in consultation with the BLC of the HKSAR and the Government of the HKSAR in accordance with the provisions and relevant procedures stipulated in Article 18 of the Basic Law. The national laws listed in Annex 3 to the Basic Law 
regardless of being applied by way of promulgation or legislation, are laws applied in Hong Kong and of legal effect. The national laws currently listed in Annex 3 to the Basic Law have not been amended since their inclusion in Annex 3. When exercising its legislative power conferred by the Constitution to enact laws, the NPCSC also has to abide by the rules stipulated in Chinese laws, such as the Legislation Law of the People's Republic of China, the SAR government in relation to the enactment of, the, of laws by the NPCSC and the criteria for making relevant decisions on behalf of the NPCSC cannot answer any questions. If there is a need to amend any national laws listed in Annex 3 to the Basic Law, it will be led by the NPC or the NPCSC in accordance with their powers conferred by law. For national laws to be added to Annex 3 to the Basic Law in the future, the NPCSC will consult the BLC and the HKSAR government in accordance with Article 18 of the Basic Law. The HKSAR government will listen to the views of different sectors having regard to actual circumstances and the subject matter concerned, and will duly reflect the actual situation in Hong Kong and specific views when being consulted by the NPCSC. Thank you, President. Ms. Tanya Chen. President, according to the way the administration put it, I'd like to seek the advice from the Bureau Director. Um, the day before yesterday, as we all know, the State Council's um, Deputy Director, Mr. Dong Zhonghua, pointed out that the uh, national security law cannot be challenged. And uh, for this part of the law, is also an important uh, constituent of Hong Kong's laws, and therefore it cannot be challenged and uh, it has the authority, and therefore Hong Kong laws cannot conflict uh, with that piece of legislation. So my question is, so is it going to be uh, applied to Hong Kong by way of promulgation and uh, um, inclusion in the list or legislation? So. Is it above the laws of Hong Kong? So what kind of status does it enjoy in Hong Kong? So if you look at Hong Kong's legal system, so is it more important than other pieces of legislation? Is it going to be by way of promulgation or should it be done by way of domestic legislation? So this is the Hong Kong version of the national security law. This is the most uh, important piece of legislation and it is supreme and it prevails over the other pieces of legislation in Hong Kong. Is that the case? Bureau Director. Thank you, Ms. Chen, for your question. As we said in the main reply, whether it's by way of promulgation or by legislation in applying the national law in Hong Kong um, by way of inclusion in Annex 3, it enjoys uh, the same equal status as um, other laws of Hong Kong. With regard to the Hong Kong National Security Law that is being enacted uh, by the NPCSC, it is still being drafted uh, by the NPCSC. And for the time being, we have no further information on that yet. And therefore, there is no way that we can answer any questions in relation to that. Sorry, speaker's not coming through. Bureau Director, do you have anything to add? Yes, even if you have not switched on the microphone, I can still hear you. Sorry, speaker's not coming through. Her mic is not on. Sorry, her, her mic is not on. President, well, other people cannot hear me. Well, Bureau Director, my question is very direct. So is it that uh, Mr. Deng Zhonghua has misunderstood um, Hong Kong's laws? So do you have to discuss with him and do you have to educate him on that? Well, let me reiterate this. With regard to the provisions, they are being drafted. So for the specific provisions as to what they are about and whether or not uh, they um, have, um, they, they would um, override Hong Kong's laws and so on. Well, 
I'm not in a position to comment on the final version of the um, national security law and whether or not uh, they would uh, be as described uh, by Ms. Chen. But then in making the decision, they would also be giving the interpretation and they've been uh, emphasizing that there are several important principles. First, um, they would be ruling um, in accordance with law. And uh, they would also ensure that uh, Hong Kong uh, residents' uh, lawful interests would also be protected. So in the course of drafting the legislation, these major principles I'm sure will be fully enshrined um, in the provisions of the uh, draft law. There was not one mention of Article 23. And then uh, the official did say something like uh, the Hong Kong government cannot answer questions relating to the enactment of laws by the National People's Congress Standing Committee. Now, this is sheer double talk. You've said a lot without saying anything. But in effect, you're telling Hong Kong people such national laws can just be a Beijing promulgation. Local legislation is completely unnecessary. Is that the message? Would this official acknowledge the fact that the Carrie Lam government has completely failed to stand up for Hong Kong? You have sold out Hong Kong. Thank you, President. Concerning the Hong Kong national security law, indeed, um, that's the responsibility of the CPG and um, is outside the um, uh, uh, sphere of or the scope of autonomy enjoyed by Hong Kong. And indeed, uh, the provisions up till now have not been uh, drafted. And therefore, the SAR government, as you can understand, before we have the formal provisions, uh, we are not in a position to comment on them. And um, in the final analysis uh, for national security is under the purview of the central people's government, but then the HKSAR government will work and cooperate fully with the NPCSC in order to enact the legislation as quickly as possible. And in the process, we will positively uh, convey the views of Hong Kong people to them. And we will also be explaining the details uh, to the different sectors in Hong Kong on the purpose and also the importance of this piece of legislation. Which part of your legislation has not been answered? of Article 23. Uh, Bureau Director, anything to add? Thank you, President. In the decision made by the NPC, they have emphasized that in the national security legislation drafting process, the SAR government should still uh, discharge its constitutional duty on legislating on Article 23 of the Basic Law. And the HKSAR government will, in accordance with Article 23, uh, be working in that direction. Yes, Mr. Eddie Chu. Thank you, President. If you look at the remarks made by Beijing officials recently, well, apparently for anything that has been included in Annex 3 of the Basic Law, they would not be subject uh, to the Basic Law and also the uh, Sino-British Joint Declaration's uh, restriction. And um, for the HK, uh, uh, for the HKMAO's uh, Deputy Director, Mr. Dong Zhonghua, he said that uh, well, the CPG will have uh, part of the jurisdiction over this piece of legislation in Hong Kong. That would be in breach of uh, Article 33 of the Sino-British Joint Declaration, that is the HKSAR, will have uh, independent uh, um, judicial power and uh, also final adjudication. So for the Hong Kong national security law, that's uh, blatantly um, in contravention of the basic law and also the joint declaration. So how are you going to be accountable to the world uh, and also different countries? Bureau Director, here I'd like to point out that at present, the NPCSC's uh, drafting work is still uh, underway with regard to how the ultimate uh, provisions are going to be like, we still uh, do not know. And as I just said, in the process, um, in the consultation 
process uh, the HKSLG will be um, conveying Hong Kong people's views to the relevant authorities. What I'd like to point out is for the ultimate version of the national security law that will be in line with the relevant provisions in the Constitution and also the basic law. And I have to emphasize that, that this will be done in accordance with law. As to the power of jurisdiction, our independent judicial power, and also the final adjudication at different levels of the CPG, they have been emphasizing that uh, with regard to the national security law, it will not affect the HKSAR's uh, independent judicial power as well as the power of final adjudication under the basic law. I'd like to point out that uh, actually under Article 19 of the basic law, it already provides that um, the SARG enjoys uh, the ju ju independent judicial power and uh, the power of final adjudication. But then at the same time, it also says that uh, for, na for national defense and so on, we do not have any power over those. And uh, as far as the state acts uh, is, are concerned, we do not have an, any um, jurisdiction over that as to ultimately what the provisions are going to be like and whether or not they'll be in line with these provisions. So we will have to look at uh, the final version of the national security law. Which part of your question has not been answered? What about the sino british Joint Declaration? That part has not been answered. Bureau Director, anything that you'd like to add? Well, the sino british Joint Declaration was signed uh, between the two parties and is a declaration about uh, how Hong Kong should be handed back to uh, China. So part of it uh, was uh, uh, declared by China, and part of that uh, was declared by the UK. And uh, the declaration was about uh, the resumption of uh, sovereignty by China in Hong Kong, and also the transitional arrangements that would be under the UK government. As far as the Chinese side is concerned, under the Joint Declaration on the Principles of the Reunification, including the arrangements after the establishment of the SARG. Basically, we can see that uh, uh, much of that uh, has been implemented in accordance with the basic law. Well, Chairman, I have a written reply, uh, which was an answer given um, on the 10th of February 1999, that's an answer or reply given to Mr. Chairman Guang about uh, Annex 3 of the Basic Law. And I quote, if there is any legislation to be included in Annex 3, if there are any impacts on Hong Kong, then they'll be referred uh, to the relevant panel of this council for consultation and the relevant uh, sectors of the Hong Kong community would also be consulted. So I'd like to ask the Bureau Director, so is that reply still valid up till now? So will the uh, government be consulting the relevant panel of this council on the national security law to be enacted? Bureau Director, as I said in the main reply, I've already said about this, and I can repeat that. Concerning that part of the question, for any um, national law to be added uh, to Annex 3 to the Basic Law in accordance with Article 18 of the Basic Law, the BLC and also the uh, HKSLG will be consulted, uh, and the SARG will look at the actual circumstances and the relevant subjects, uh, be listening to the views of the various quarters. And then uh, when the uh, NPC consults um, the HKSARG, we will also be reflecting the actual situation in Hong Kong and specific views when being consulted. So I have nothing further to add to that. Alvin Young, President, uh, so do I have to retrain myself on my Cantonese? Is it that uh, the bureau director does not understand what I said? Uh, well, when Michael Shin represented the government in giving this reply, for any laws to be included in Annex 3, this council will be consulted. So I'd like to ask Mr. Zhang, well, either you, you withdraw the remarks from Mr. Michael Shin, or you just said that it's wrong. So it's a simple question. Why can't you answer the question? I have nothing further to add, Bureau Director. Yeah. <coughs> Question three, Dr. Helena Wong.
Regarding the regulation under which people arising, arriving in Hong Kong from overseas shall be subject to 14-day compulsory quarantine, the government has extended its expiry date to 18 September this year, straddling the polling date set for the 2020 Legislative Council general election, that is 6 September. The government has indicated that it will consider allowing electors under compulsory quarantine to go out temporarily to cast their votes. However, some Hong Kong people who are currently outside Hong Kong intend to make a special trip to return Hong Kong to cast their votes have indicated that the set arrangement is still unsatisfactory owing to personal circumstances leaving to Hong Kong. They have to leave Hong Kong shortly after casting their votes and will be unable to stay in Hong Kong to complete the quarantine procedure. Regarding the polling arrangements for the election, will the government inform this council one whether it has finalized the, the arrangements for those persons who are under compulsory quarantine and for those uh, COVID-19 patients who are receiving the medical treatment to cast their votes on the polling day? If so, of the details. Two, whether it will exempt those electors who have made special trip to return to Hong Kong to cast their votes from the 14-day compulsory quarantine requirement, if so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. And three, whether it will set up a polling station inside the restricted area of the Hong Kong International Airport to facilitate those electors outside Hong Kong who will make a special trip to return to Hong Kong to tr on, or transit by Hong Kong to cast their votes, if so, of the details, if not the sense for the reasons for that. Thank for Constitutional and Mainland Affairs. Mr. President, after consulting the Food and Health Bureau, our consolidated reply to Dr. Helena Wong's question is as follows. The Chief Secretary has published in the Gazette on 12 June that the 2020 Legislative Council general election will be held on 6 September this year. The nomination period of the LegCo general election is set from 18th to 31st July this year. We note that although the situation of COVID-19 outbreak in Hong Kong and the number of confirmed cases have slightly stabilized in the past month or so, the situation still remains volatile with local cluster cases reported again recently. At the same time, the global situation remains severe. As at 16 June, 218 countries, territories or areas reported a total of around 7.86 million COVID-19 cases. Since late March, about 70,000 to 130,000 new cases have been reported daily around the world. As regards the mainland, Despite significant improvements in the situation, individual provinces or cities still reported a certain number of imported and local cases in the past few weeks. The above situation reflects that the epidemic is yet to be over, whether in Hong Kong or places outside Hong Kong. Considering that COVID-19 epidemic is not expected to fade away in the near future, we will closely keep in touch with the Food and Health Bureau and the Center for Health Protection to carefully monitor the development of the outbreak in assessing the impact of the epidemic on the Legislative Council election from now until the polling date and, and formulate various plans in view of the different possibilities concerning the development of the epidemic in a timely manner. The Registration and Electoral Office, or REO, all along does not set up polling stations in hospitals, but will explore whether special arrangements could be made for electors under com compulsory quarantine to go out temporarily to cast their votes in a safe manner. The voting rights of citizens are protected by the basic law. When formulating measures that are related to the prevention of COVID-19 in the election, the SAR government will endeavor to strike a balance among factors like public health, protection, social acceptance, electors, facilitation, etc. The HSAR government 
has earlier published in the Gazette to amend the compulsory quarantine of certain persons arriving in Hong Kong regulation, CAP 599C, and the compulsory quarantine of persons arriving in Hong Kong from foreign places regulation, CAP 599E, by extending their validity. We shall closely monitor movement of people between Hong Kong and other places and implement compulsory quarantine measures as well as development of the epidemic situation in the mainland and overseas in order to decide the plan to be adopted to, fac- to facilitate electors to vote. We will finalize the details and announce them to the public in due course. Regarding the setting up of a polling station inside the Hong Kong International Airport, in accordance with Section 30 of the Electoral Affairs Commission, Electoral Affairs Commission Electoral Procedure Legislative Council Regulation Cap 541D, the Chief Electoral Officer must allocate to each elector an authorized representative a polling station or polling stations to cast a vote or votes. He or she is entitled to cast at an election. The Chief Electoral Officer must also allocate to a geographical constituency or GC elector, a GC polling station that is as far as practicable close to his or her registered residential address to cast a vote for the GC. To this end, the REO must prepare an extract of the register of electors for each polling station for staff at the polling station to verify the elector's eligibility to vote before issuance of ballot papers. Taking into account that there are difficulties in ascertaining the information and number of electors who will return to Hong Kong or transit via Hong Kong on the polling day, the the REO considers that it will be difficult to prepare the set extract of register of electors prior to the polling day. At this stage, The REO considers that the proposal to register a polling station in the restricted area of the international airport may not be feasible, but it will continue to explore if the relevant technical difficulties can be overcome or adopt other practical ways to enable voters returning from abroad to vote. Besides, in order to ensure elector safety and prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the polling stations and counting stations, we plan to implement the following proposed safety measures. One, all polling staff are required to wear a mask and those showing signs of fever will not be allowed to discharge electoral duties. Two, before entering the polling stations, electors, candidates and agents are required to put on their own masks properly and rub their hands by using alcohol-based hand rub placed at the entrance of the polling stations. 3. Installation of infrared thermographic camera at polling stations as far as possible possible to screen out electors showing signs of fever and provision of handheld electronic thermometers to polling stations where it is not possible to install such camera. 4. Upon arrival at the polling station, temperatures of electors, candidates and agents will be taken. Candidates and agents showing signs of fever would be advised not to enter the polling station. And 5. Providing disinfecting sprays or wipes for polling staff to disinfect polling tables, tick shops, paper boards, etc. regularly. The government will continue to make proactive preparations and arrangements to ensure that the electoral general election in September will be conducted in a fair, open and honest manner whilst meeting the public health and safety requirements. Thank you. Dr. Helena Wong. Many parts of my answers have not been addressed specifically uh, concerning hospitals, and the airport, uh, whether there were polling stations, and whether the persons under quarantine can go out and go out to vote, and so on. Now, uh, all this is still under study. Now, this is uh, very close to the actual dates. Now, the secretary said that the the election would be held fairly. And you will note that the... uh, 
uh, mandatory quarantine date is July 7th, and for the those arriving from abroad, it's 18th of September, and the elections would start on uh, 6th of September. That is, those living in the mainland on 6th of September, they can come to Hong Kong freely to vote. But those returning from abroad, when they come back, because due to the regulations, they cannot go to the polling station right away. So you are creating an unfair situation. Se Mr. Secretary, can you state clearly, will you consider cancelling the requirement in respect of some countries uh, like UK and Ireland where the uh, affected numbers have been falling. Can you uh, cancel the mandatory um, quarantine requirement for them uh, so that uh, they can share the same uh, privilege as those from the mainland so that they can come back and uh, vote at the polling station? We thank the member for her question. We hope that natural members can understand. It's true that right now the COVID situation is still volatile and it's still, there are developing situations uh, both here and abroad. Uh, 20 odd years ago, uh, 20 odd days ago, uh, situation in Hong Kong was quite stable and then suddenly we have clusters of infections. In the mainland, the situation was stable and then in Beijing, there has appeared a local uh, infection situation. So this shows that the volatility in the pandemic is difficult to forecast. Now, regarding the elections, earlier, due to the pandemic, we have uh, extended certain dates uh, because we are monitoring the development of the pandemic. I hope members to understand. Now, may I elaborate? Now, why is it that until now, as the member said, we haven't come to specific decisions? It's because given the pandemic, uh, the uh, public gathering bans uh, and so on, uh, these have to be adjusted. Uh, and uh, in fact, we relax the ban yesterday. So the uh, preventive measures uh, are continued, continuing to develop. So we will continue to monitor the situation, work closely with the uh, Food and Health Bureau and the uh, Center of Health Protection, and we will formulate plans accordingly. The overall principle is that we try to facilitate the voters in exercising their votes to right, uh, rights to vote, and we will also uh, strike a balance uh, with regard to public health. As for members mentioning of uh, different legislation, uh, the uh, quarantine arrangements, etc. Now, the uh, valid periods uh, may be uh, subject to uh, public health considerations and experts' views. Uh, they can be adjusted. Now, it's still some time from the September elections. For now, we cannot say whether we will further extend the uh, uh, arrangements, uh, and but this is uh, uh, based mainly on public health considerations. Please let the secretary finish his answer. 
please let the public listen to the pub, the secretary's answer. The validity, validity periods are different because the implementation dates are different. Now, the legislation can be extended. Uh, doesn't mean that uh, now, if necessary, uh, we can make extensions. I wish to say that for people returning from different places to vote, we understand the situation in our plans. Our principle is that wherever possible, we try to facilitate the public in exercising their voting rights. Now, on the specific ways to implement that uh, due to the development of the epidemic, we cannot tell you exactly right now because it's still some time off to the elections. Of course, we will be proactive in the meantime. We are studying the different plans or options. And once the decisions are made, we will disclose them to the public as quickly as possible. Maybe the secretary is not expressing himself properly. I was saying that the legislation have different has different dates uh, for those returning from the mainland and from abroad. Uh, so one is July, one is uh, 18th of September. Now, do, does the secretary have anything to add? Now you keep repeating that, Dr. Wong, you have made your point. Can the secretary answer, please? As for the dates referred to by Dr. Wong, I wish to point out that the validity period, uh, whether those will be extended, we do not know yet. Will they be extended to beyond the uh, voting date? Uh, it's now not possible to say. Chen Chi Chun. We don't know how the epidemic will develop by September. If the epidemic gets more serious, the voting itself might be postponed or even cancelled. <clears throat> but the member is asking what plans are available but the secretary is unable to give an answer. He said that uh, we'll see. He says that uh, he, he doesn't want people to be unable to exercise their voting rights. Now, the government is saying that you are offering many business exemptions. In paragraph 3, for those in hospitals, you can transport them to some place for them to vote safely. Now, on the medical side, for those arriving in Macau for repeat consultation, I talked to the hospital authority. They can come in to Hong Kong, go to hospital right away, and they don't have to undergo quarantine, and then they can go right back to Macau. For those coming from the mainland, now, they have to take into account the quarantine period. Will you exempt them? Now, they come back to vote. They can go back right away. As I said, we are not uh, sitting on our hands and doing nothing. We are actively uh, studying different options or plans. The principle is that as far as possible, we will try to facilitate the public exercising their voting rights. <laughs> of course, uh, we take into account uh, that some people arriving from abroad, now we try to accommodate that. We have to take into account uh, public safety considerations, we will try to let them come back 
and woke. Now, uh, I, now you're saying whether we will tr not prevent them from voting uh, because of the quarantine measure, or what measures we can take. Now, all those will be studied by us. We are working with the LEO and the EAC to try to find ways to facilitate the voters. I believe that in due course, uh, a little later, we will uh, announce the measures. The question has not been answered. Can you exempt them? When people come back from abroad, they have to get leave from their jobs, they have to buy air tickets, they have to do a lot of work. Please be assured that we do care for them. <coughs> we are studying how to facilitate those returning from abroad. We are studying the possible options. The FHB is studying those options. We try to control the risks. All those will be considered. We will announce uh, reasonably in advance. Question for the Honourable uh, Lo Wai Kwong. Thank you. I'd like to welcome uh, the Secretary for Innovation and Technology for attending the first uh, question session of this council in its capacity as the S4T. The government has over the years been promoting the collaboration among the government industry, academic and research sectors and established the Innovation and Technology Fund to facilitate projects that contribute to the INT upgrading in the manufacturing and service industries. On the other hand, the Outline Development Plan for the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area or the Outline Development Plan promulgated by the Central People's Government in February last year outlines the vision of developing an international INT hub. On promoting the development of INT, will the government inform this council, one, as there have been comments that the various funding schemes under ITF lack overall efficient efficacy due to the absence of collaboration, whether the government will consolidate the various funding schemes as well as formally a set of unified and specific targets and performance indicators, with a view to enhancing the efficacy of ITF, if so, if the details not the reasons for that. Two, whether there is formulated any overall planning to enhance the collaboration among universities, research institutions, including Hong Kong Cyber Port Management Company Limited, Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation, Hong Kong Applied Science and Technology Research Institute Company Limited, and the industries, with a view to dovetailing the targets set out in the outline development plan, such as enhancing the in-depth integration of industries, academia, and research, and promoting the commercial application of technological achievements, it was sort of the details of not reasons for that. Three, given that Hong Kong has during the past six months been relentlessly affected by the Sino-US trade conflicts, social incidents, and the con a coronavirus disease 2019, resulting in the research and development activities of tertiary institutions, production of the manufacturing industry, and even the businesses of related industries, such as testing and certification, having been dealt a heavy blow. Whether the government has assessed the impacts of the aforesaid situation on the collaboration among the government, industry, academic, and research sector has rolled out the corresponding measures. If so, the details are not the reasons for that. Secretary for Innovation and Technology. President, development of INT requires collaboration among the government, industry, academia, and research institutes to create a synergy. The current home government has been pushing INT development in eight directions, including increasing research resources for R&D, pulling together technology talent, and providing technological research infrastructure with a view to uh, facilitating cooperation among the above-mentioned sectors. My reply to the three parts of Mr. Lowe's question is as follows. One, currently there are 16 funding schemes under the ITF, each with its own objectives, which include supporting R&D, facilitating technology adoption, nurturing INT talents, setting, supporting technology setups, and 
promoting INT culture. Each has its own specific target groups and modus operandi, and the ways and criteria to evaluate the effectiveness differ. Taking the innovation and technology support program as an example, organizations being funded are required to submit reports to the INT Commission two years after project completion to report in detail the intellectual property rights generated from the project. Whether the project has been successfully commercialized, commercialization incomes received, the number of jobs created, etc. As regards the technology voucher program, which encourages enterprises to adopt technology solutions, applicants are required to report six months after completion on whether it has improved the productivity or helped in upgrading or transformation of enterprises. However, the effectiveness of some funding schemes is hard to quantify. For instance, the general support program supports non-R&D projects which help upgrade local industries and promote an IT culture in Hong Kong, such as conferences, exhibitions, etc. As the cultivation of an IT culture is a long-term and continuous endeavor, the progress and effectiveness of which um, may not uh, be easily quantified. From time to time, review and consolidate different schemes to better support and facilitate the industry. For example, the ITC consolidated a former university industry collaboration program and the collective, collaborative stream of the ITSP in January last year to launch the more flexible partnership research program, which supports collaborative research programs jointly conducted by local universities, public research institutions, and private companies. Moreover, from July on, we'll merge the researcher program and the postdoctorate hub to provide more flexibility for enterprises in engaging research researchers. Two, the development of an international INT hub is one of the priorities of the online development plan. Hong Kong has strong R&D capabilities and advantages as an international and market-oriented economy, while other cities in the GBA can provide a sizable market as well as capabilities in commercializing R&D results and advanced manufacturing. Hong Kong, with other cities in the GBA, can create synergy by using their respective strengths and build up a complete industries chain from R&D commercialization of R&D results to production, logistics, and marketing. In this regard, government will continue to strengthen the INT ecosystem in Hong Kong and actively participate in the work of developing the GBA into an international INT hub. We're pressing ahead with the establishment of two in the Hong Kong research clusters in Hong Kong Science Park. The first batch of R&D uh, laboratories is expected to come on stream this year and to further promote global R&D collaboration in Hong Kong. We are actively exploring the establishment of a third in the Hong Kong research cluster. In terms of facilitating the flow of key elements of scientific research, the central government announced in May 2018 that universities and research institutes in Hong Kong can gradually bid for funding to undertake central fiscal science and technology projects on the basis of merit and competition. And the approved funding can be remitted across the border for use in Hong Kong. Over the past two years, the Ministry of Science and Technology in some provinces and cities have approved over 250 million RMB for local universities and research institutes to conduct projects or established laboratory. We're also developing the Hong Kong Shenzhen INT Park, or the park in the Lok Ma Chao Loop, um, a key cooperation base in scientific research and various planning infrastructure works have commenced progressively. We expect that the park uh, will complement the strengths of the industries in Shenzhen and further promote the commercialization of R&D results. On the other hand, Hong Kong s and Park Corporation Cyber Port have launched corresponding measures and schemes to facilitate expansion of businesses of local enterprises in GBA. The S3 will also continue to collaborate with enterprises operating business in both Hong Kong and GBA and assist the industry in applying technology and exploring business opportunities. The social incidents in the past year, half year or so, as well as the epidemic and conflicts between China and Hong Kong U.S. did to a certain extent impact on the development of INT in Hong Kong in the short term. Social incidents and uh, the unstable external economic and trade environment have also uh, made some of the companies, small and medium enterprises, a startup with less cash uh, to put on hold their business expansion. The epidemic has also affected the outbound exchanges of uh, the academia and technology companies. However, the current epidemic has also created some opportunities for the sector, such as uh, the software and hardware required for distance business and e-learning. 
the government, industry, academia, and research institutes are all determined to turn the crisis into opportunities and respond to changes proactively and flexibly. To support the industry, the government has set aside $380 million under the Anti Epidemic Fund to provide a full six month rental waiver to tenants and startups in Hong Kong. Science Park Industry, Industrial Estates, and Cyber Port is expected to benefit about 1,800 enterprises. We've also launched the Distance Business Program to provide funding support to enterprises to adopt IT solutions for developing distance business. The Secretariat has received a total of 3,834 applications to enroll on the IT service providers reference list and over 13,000 funding applications from enterprises. At the same time, the government has proactively adopted local R&D outcomes to help combat the epidemic. The ITC launched a special for for projects under the Public Sector Trial Scheme of the ITF to support product development and application of technologies for the prevention and control of the epidemic, as well as to foster the commercialization of relevant results. So far, 25 applications have been approved under the special call involving funding amount of about $42.8 million for trials in over 40 public sector organizations. The government will collaborate with Hong Kong TDC to share for overseas market Hong Kong's experience in applying technology to combat the epidemic and explore more business opportunities for our industry. In fact, Hong Kong enjoys tremendous strength in scientific research, the advantage as an international market oriented economy. It is believed that with collaboration across our sectors, the local IT industry will continue to prosper in the long term. Mr. Lo Wai Kwok. In the main reply, it is said that uh, the uh, Hong Kong Shamja Innovation and Technology Park is being developed in the Lok Ma Chow Loop. I'd like to know the progress of uh, the infrastructure and the timetable for the first batch of INT companies to move into the park. Secretary, thank you. The government is pressing ahead with the development of the park in the Lok Ma Chow Loop, and the preparation is uh, in progress. Site formation and uh, detailed design and site investigation of uh, the uh, first phase has started in 2018, June and September, respectively. If everything goes smoothly, we believe that uh, the first uh, site will be available in 2020 by 2021. Now, we are conducting a feasibility study and, and uh, economic analysis. The park will, on uh, the basis of the result, uh, consider the uh, operating costs required for the first phase. We're now consulting the Hang Kok District Councils on the development of the loop, and uh, depending on the progress of um, the consultation, we will uh, consult the council as well. And we'll also, in due course, apply for funding for uh, the first phase of the park. There will be eight building blocks in the first phase. Uh, there will be a building uh, for laboratories. There will also uh, be R&D centers uh, for officers and also quarters for uh, the personnel there. With funding from LegCo, uh, the first batch of buildings can be completed in phases four years after that. Mr. Tony Z, thank you. Development of INT, of course, is uh, of um, vital importance, and for sure we should support it. However, we have to ensure that we get value of money for public money. So, uh, what you have done is important to the public, so that they can understand um, what how INT can benefit them. My question is very simple. The Finance Committee is now vetting a funding application of uh, over $1 billion for the INT Fund. Now, the INT Fund has been established for a long time, and the government has injected over $10 billion into the fund. So, Secretary, as far as you know, can you at least uh, uh, tell the public three important achievements of uh, the fund. Successful commercialization of R&D product, um, and uh, economic gain, and how people's uh, quality of life can benefit. Now, uh, there is no need to mention um, uh, a CU mask. Thank you. Indeed, uh, this government 
has uh, injected over a hundred billion dollars into INT. When we measure the outcome of INT, we should not just look at the success of individual projects, but we should see how they can improve people's livelihood and our economy. To sh quote some figures, now in 2014, in the uh, Secretary, uh, can you move your mobile phone? Now, uh, we uh, have uh, many startups in 2014. Uh, there were about 1,065. In 2019, we got 3,184. In 2014, uh, we attracted uh, $1.24 billion in venture capital funds. However, in 2019, that grew to $17 billion. Now, by means of startups, startups we would like to provide high value added jobs and to um, add impetus to our economy. And uh, our efforts have started to pay off. Our, we urge the Council to continue to support our work. During the epidemic, we uh, use a lot of uh, locally developed technology. Uh, the uh, CO mask is one example, and we've also got our electronic wristband uh, to help uh, mandatory home quarantine and our follow-up work. We've also got our nano coating uh, to help uh, disinfection in the control of the disease. And we've also got a, a very efficient nano filter to help convert hospital wards into negative pressure wards. All these are outcomes of our local R and D efforts. So uh, we are turning this uh, current crisis brought about by the COVID nineteen into opportunities for further development of uh, the industry. Mr. Mark and Liu, uh, with uh, the uncertainties associated with our economy and also the COVID-19, our economy has been a delta blow, and many uh, startups are now short of cash as a result. And statistics show that about 40% of uh, those startups have uh, laid off staff. Although uh, we have got uh, 108 uh, startups uh, generating, uh, graduating from our science park, and we've also uh, got a public uh, sector uh, trial scheme uh, to uh, help uh, these uh, startups. The TDC has got a three month trial scheme to help startups to develop their business. When it comes to uh, promotion and fundraising for products of that uh, startups, they face increasing challenges. And the coming six months are certainly challenging times for them. I'd like to know whether you have um, evaluated the impact on startups in the past year. Startups uh, may not be uh, able to take out loans from banks. Will you draw reference uh, from uh, countries like Germany, and then you can have a special relief uh, program for startups so that they can uh, have um, cash chain for them. Secretary, we understand that startups face considerable challenges because of uh, the epidemic. So we have uh, been uh, giving them various supports. In my main reply, I said that in, we will support startups in our uh, science park and uh, cyber port by means of a rental waiver. And uh, we have different subsidy programs for them. And we have regular programs to help our startups, for instance, Startups uh, have to recruit talent. Uh, we have our postdoctoral postdoctoral hub and researcher program to assist our startups to employ new graduates from our local universities. For instance, for each uh, graduate, we subsidize thirty. $2,000 and also for a uh, master graduate, $21,000 and a doctorate of $18,000 per month. 
of subsidy to help retain talent. Startups uh, should uh, be given funding support, but the more important thing is to help commercialization of their products. Uh, so uh, there is a matching arrangement with our funding scheme, and this uh, will help the commercialization R&D of startups. So in terms of rental support and uh, help in financing and uh, also uh, talent support, we've got uh, different programs. And as mentioned, we have a public tri sector trial scheme. We invite startups to support the government in R&D to fight academic and results. I mean, a response has been very encouraging. So we offer them an opportunity to commercialize uh, their products using this opportunity. Now, for the distance business program, how do we assess the industry? We give them a business opportunity based on uh, helping the uh, distance business capability of SMEs. Now, SMEs will have uh, to operate in a distance mode, uh, such as online uh, meal ordering and uh, uh, conferences. We assist SMEs to purchase hardware and software for bis distance uh, business mode. This will create a market for our setups, startups so that they can launch the products into the market. And we're also enhancing the capability of our enterprises in distance uh, business mode. Mr. Shukafai, I'm sure political parties would support the uh, development of INT, and that's why we have so many plans. Now, I would like to ask a question about the distance business program. Now, uh, because of COVID-19, many people are stuck at home and they will have to order uh, food and uh, also uh, necessities uh, online. And myself and uh, my sector very much look forward to uh, applying for funding under the distance uh, business program. Each uh, can apply up to $300,000, but uh, the ceiling uh, under the program is only $500 billion. I understand that 13,000 uh, enterprises uh, have applied for funding and they are waiting on the list. Uh, can you urge the CE or the CS4A to inject uh, more capital into the distance business program? So instead of $500 million, there can be uh, more. Well, within a short period of one month, uh, we've received a very enthusiastic response under the distance business program. Uh, we've uh, heard uh, the aspirations of the industry and the public. We hope that uh, more capital can be injected into this program so that um, more SMEs can benefit and there uh, can be more business opportunities uh, for the industry so they can contribute to our economy. Question number five, Mr. Wilson Orr. Yes, wait, what's the question, Dr. Helena Wong? A quorum call, please.
，我唱食完，我 Mr. Wilson 哦 ，Mr. Wilson 哦。Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, intake of residents for the e-residents, the first starter homes for Hong Kong residents pilot project developed by the Urban Renewal Authority commenced last month. Some flat owners of that housing court have complained that they have to pay exorbitant management fees, which amount to four point three dollars per square foot, and are even higher than those of certain private housing courts. The exorbitant management fees, coupled with property mortgage repayments, have aggravated their financial burden. In this connection, will the government inform this council? One. Given that the prices of starter home flats are positioned at a level between those of home ownership scheme (HOS) courts and private housing courts, whether it has assessed if the management fees of starter homes as HOS housing courts should be pitched at a level between those of HOS courts and private housing courts, if it has conducted such an assessment of the outcome, two. Whether the government participated in determining the management fee level of the e-residents, and C, and、uh, three, whether it will set up a mechanism to monitor the management fee levels of SH housing courts. Secretary for Transport and Housing. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the objective of Starter Homes SH pilot projects for Hong Kong residents is to enrich the housing ladder by adding a rung. Below private housing and above the home ownership scheme (HOS), as a type of subsidised sale flats or SSFs, SH aims to help the high-income families who are not eligible for HOS and yet cannot afford private housing to meet their home ownership aspirations in the face of high property prices. In June 2018, the government invited the Urban Renewal Authority or URA to assign its redevelopment project at Matawai Road as an SH pilot project E residence. Subsequently, URA announced the pre-sale of 450 SH units at E residence in December 2018. All SH units were sold in June 2019. Following the completion of the project, URA commenced execution of assignment and handover procedures in early May this year. My reply to various parts of the question raised by Mr. Wilson or Chong Sing is as follows: One, currently there are three major types of SSFs under different rungs along the housing ladder, namely Green Form Subsidised Home Ownership Scheme (GSH), HOS, and SH. The positioning and relativity of these three types of SSFs along the housing ladder are reflected in the discount of the selling prices of the units. Therefore, the discount rate of GSX units would be higher than that for the HOS sale exercise, while the discount rate for of SX units would be lower than that for the HOS sale exercise. As for the e-residence project. SX units were sold at 62% of the assessed market values. That is a discount rate of 38%, which was 10% less than the 48% discount for the previous HOS sale exercise in 2018. From the perspective of property management, there is no difference between SSF projects and private residential projects in general. The management fee level of housing projects, no matter for SSF or private residential projects, is affected by a number of factors, including development scale of the housing estate, number of units, community facilities, and ancillary infrastructures provided by the housing estate, expenditure on daily maintenance and repair works, number of security guards and cleaning workers, as well as fees for hiring property management company, etc. In general, if there are fewer building blocks and units in the housing estate, or more community facilities such as clubhouse and gym provided by the housing estate, the management fees to be shared by each unit would be higher. Considering that spe the specific circumstances of different housing projects may be widely different, the government does not consider it appropriate to lay down a set of rigid indicators with regard to the management fee level. In inviting URA to assign its redevelopment project at Matawai Road as SH pilot project. 
The government has specified certain requirements concerning ASIC units under the relevant lease modification document, including that the units can only be sold to persons meeting the eligibility criteria specified by the government, the pricing should be subject to the approval by the government, and there should be alienation restrictions for the units, etc. While matters concerning the determination of management fee level are not included, the government was not involved in the determination of the management fee level of e-residents. According to information provided by URA, in determining the manage management fee level of e-residents, URA has made reference to the management fees of residential projects in the market with comparable development scale and facilities, and the management fee level of e-residents is compatible with the current market level. According to the government's understanding, Depending on the scale and relevant facilities of individual housing estates, the management fee level of private residential projects completed in recent years is around four to five dollars per square foot in general. As mentioned above, the management fee level is affected by a number of factors. It would be difficult for the government to specify the management fee level and relevant indicators for ASIC projects which are of reference value. Moreover, if the government sets restrictions on the management fee level for ASIC projects, in order to comply with relevant requirements, developers may unavoidably need to make a trade-offs on areas such as facilities and ancillary infrastructures of the housing estates. This may reduce the flexibility of developers in the design of ASIC projects, and it is not in line with the original intent of the government to fully utilize the experience and expertise of developers in designing and constructing buildings to provide ASIC units. Mr. Wilson, oh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the E residence was oversubscribed by 45 times. There were 20,800 applications for 450 SX units. Well, last time at the meeting of the panel on housing, the secretary uh, commented that the discount rate for HOS would be kept at uh, 70%, whereas for uh, SH, the discount rate will be 80%. There will be an upcoming project in Anderson Road, uh, and the, again, the discount rate would be 80%. Uh, I'd like to share this experience with uh, Secretary. Well, I visited uh, one of the units at E Residence, and according to the young flat owner in his 30s, he was able to afford a, prop, um, a mortgage repayment of uh, $20,000 plus a month. And uh, with a 62% discount rate, he managed uh, to buy this flat at the price of $6.4 million, whereas if it's kept at 80%, it would be sold at $8 million. So it would go beyond the affordability of uh, young flat owners. By that time, no reasonable discount rate could be offered because of soaring property prices. Now it is set at 80% uh, discount. Can we lower the uh, rate? And then would it be up to the developer to decide? And will they deploy tricks? to prop up the retail prices and then offer the 80% count to reap a bigger profit. Mr. President, thank you, Mr. All, for the follow-up question. Indeed, there is a strong demand for home ownership in Hong Kong. The government's policy is very clear. Without compromising the supply of public housing, we will strive to increase the supply of starter home units. In last year's policy address, the chief executive also announced that the Urban Renewal Authority will be given a new mission, in other words, to develop SX units. We understand that the Urban Renewal Authority is undertaking a study so as to provide starter home units in the existing URA projects. I believe once this study is completed with the approval of the board of the URA, information will be disseminated. Mr. Wilson all referred to the um, price capping of HOS units. I believe that uh, there is some misunderstanding, and perhaps we didn't make ourselves clear. Well, HOS is, uh, pricing is uh, 
set according to the afford, uh, affordability of um, prospective owners. In other words, it is based on the monthly median household income. For HOS flats rolled out in the same batch, we do require at least 75% of HOS flats available for sale to meet this affordability requirement. So the price of HOS units will be packed to the market value prevailing at the time as well as the public's affordability. As mentioned just now, for GSH, HOS, and SH projects, these are the three different rungs on our housing ladder. As such, there are different tiers of pricing for these different types, all having regard to people's affordability. So be it SH, HOS, or GSH, We set an income and asset limit for prospective buyers. We consider conducting reviews in light of the um, prevailing economic and social situations. And like Mr. Wilson all said, some young people have moved into a 400 square foot home. Well, some people may, uh, I mean, some young people may be high income earners yet uh, are not able to afford private housing. And we believe the SH pilot projects will be very beneficial uh, for this target group. Well, I think Secretary hasn't answered my question at all. Let me ask once again. Does the developer set the price list, price list for these units and will they proper prices and then sell the flats at the 80% discount in order to, to scoop uh, a bigger profit? Let me make it clear, Mr. President. Pricing will be set according to the affordability of eligible households. Be it the government or URA. And also for the starter home pilot project at Anderson Road, the site of which had just been sold, these will be referenced uh, references to the um, pricing of units in the end. To provide certainty, however, for the Anderson Road project and for the developer to um, set pricing according to these factors, we consider these factors and believe that by setting a discount rate of 80%, it will be forward looking for the uh, future arrangements. Dr. Junius Ho, in part three of the Secretary's reply, I heard the secretary say uh, the following. The question was whether it will set up a mechanism to monitor the management fee levels of Essex housing courts. The secretary's, re uh, the secretary's reply is that it's quite difficult and that if government sets restrictions on the manage management fee level, it will reduce flexibility of developers in the design of projects. But I think it's a matter of trade-offs. Because when it comes to management fees, we have three elements. Um, that is profit for the property management company itself, and also security matters, and the number of security guards to be hired. And third element, other matters, such as um, refuse, refuse disposal, cleaning workers, clubhouse maintenance. These should be charged on a reimbursement basis. Well. At the moment, the management fee is $4.3 per square foot. This is really on the high side. I agree that we should buy by the free market principle. But the government does have a role to play in starter home pilot projects. The government should tap the pulse of the market and help the underprivileged owners of the starter home pilot projects to give them more protection. Will you consider doing your homework, conduct more studies so as to provide guidelines for reference to protect the interests of starter home owners? Secretary, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Dr. Ho, for the follow-up question. Regarding SH units provided by URA, they 
have certain principles regarding the setting of a um, management fee level. First principle is cost recovery. There is no uh, consideration of um, profit making. Second, like Dr. Junius Ho said, it is done on a reimbursement basis having regard to the actual expenditure. And also the management fee for the property management company. And to make provisions for future maintenance and repair. But all in all, it is a transparent mechanism uh, built on a reimbursement basis. Be it HOS, provided by the Housing Authority, Housing Society of Hong Kong, as well as starter homes under the URA. In the DMC, there are protect. There is protection for owners. That is, the owners corporation, having been incorporated, will be the legal entity in deciding uh, matters relating to the housing estate. And the OC can also give direction to the PMC as it sees fit. There is also an arrangement for the OC to replace the PMC within three months. So we have a fair, impartial and transparent mechanism for, OC, uh, for owners to make sure the interests are looked after uh, in the DMCs and in the leases. I believe be it the HA, a Housing Society and URA have noted your comment. And they will continue to uphold this mechanism with a mission to serve Hong Kong and provide the greatest protection to owners. Dr. N. Chang, Mr. President, well, I read the paper today and not until then did I learn that the management fee charged uh, for this uh, SH pilot project as an SSF amounted to $4.3 per square foot. Well, I checked uh, the uh, management fees for some of the uh, private housing estates. Nga Lai Court, for example, is $3 per square foot. And also for the elements in Chim Sa Choi and West Kowloon, that's a rather um, prestigious uh, private housing estate, the management fee level is set at uh, some $4 per square foot. But then we have the subsidized sale flat here. Buyers buy their homes at a discount uh, on some conditions, of course. And I really find it problematic that such exorbitant management fees are charged. Secretary, my suggestion is that uh, maybe time is right for you to review the ordinance because apart from exorbitant management fees charged at SSF flats, management fees at private housing estates may not be as high, but they do keep a huge reserve. That is, in the end, the huge reserve is kept by either the owner's corporation or the property management company. Maybe it's a loophole because some property management companies are controlled by a handful. And then we have ongoing litigation about uh, these disputes. Say, if the um, management company is dissolved and um, that the buildings are not properly managed, there will be problems. Would you conduct a review of the ordinance? Secretary, thank you, Mr. Pre President, and thank you, Dr. N. Chang, for her questions. Let me share with you some statistics about uh, management fees. For recently completed development projects in the private sector, I have information at hand. And the average I mean, uh, let me tell you the range. It ranges from $3 to $7.6 for the recently completed 30 projects or so, depending on the number of facilities available. 
statistics aside, even for HOS housing estates, the level ranges from some one dollar to some four dollars. Well, I understand, but that is the actual situation. I understand uh, Dr. An Cheng's point whether there is a need to have a huge provision, contingency provision for maintenance. The law authorizes the owner's corporation uh, to do certain things, and under that ordinance, the owner's corporation or the management committee can uh, review the matter. At the same time, I will also urge uh, my colleagues to think carefully uh, about the management matters, and we can also follow up on the matter under the building management ordinance, be it private or public housing estates. Management fees are needed for uh, daily maintenance and repair, and it's a uh, recurrent expenditure for flat owners anyway. Uh, I've noted members' views, and I will continue to liaise with the relevant authorities. Last question, seek or reply. Dr. Rebo Cheng Lei Wen. To attract non-locally trained doctors to practice in Hong Kong so as to alleviate the manpower shortage of doctors in public hospitals, I and fellow members of the party to which I belong to propose in the middle of last year to amend the medical registration ordinance to the effect that non-locally trained doctors who have been in employment for the hospital authority, HA, under limited registration for not less than five years and with satisfactory work performance will be qualified to apply for full registration as a registered doctor without having to go through the required exam. The government responded that as the proposal was controversial, it was not an opportune time, quote unquote, to amend the ordinance without full consultation of the stakeholders. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, whether it had assessed at what time and upon what conditions have been met, it will be an opportune time to implement the aforesaid proposal, and what has consulted HA and other stakeholders on the proposal. If it has consulted of the details of the views collected, including the ratio between those views for and against the proposal and justification, therefore, whether it will consult the members of the public on the proposal. Two, whether it knows the current situation of the manpower shortage of doctors in public hospitals and the impact of such situation and the quality on public health care services. And three, given that as at the end of March this year, there were only 24 non-locally trained doctors employed by HA under limited registration, whether it has reviewed the effectiveness of the effort in tracking such doctors to practice in Hong Kong. If it's reviewed and the outcome is that the efforts are satisfactory, whether the government will consider providing more incentives for such doctors to practice in Hong Kong, e.g. by implementing the aforesaid proposal, if so, of the timetable, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Food and Health. President. The government has taken a multi pronged approach to tackle the severe shortage of doctors in the public health care system by Interalia, increasing the numbers of health care training places, providing funding for universities to upgrade and increase their health care training capacities, as well as supporting the manpower initiatives of the hospital authority. The government will also continue to actively promote and publicize the, for the limited registration arrangement overseas and conduct recruitment exercises for attract qualified and non-locally trained healthcare professionals to practice in Hong Kong. My reply to the question raised by Dr. Chang is as follows. One, the Food and Health Bureau has set a multi-party platform in March last year engaging the representatives of the Medical Council of Hong Kong, MCHK, the Hong Kong Academy of Medicine, HKAM, and the Hong Kong Medical Association, the HA and two medical schools in Hong Kong, and the Department of Health to discuss feasible options for increasing the doctor's supply. In the past year or so, a number of measures to increase the supply of doctors have been implemented. For instance, for non-locally trained specialist doctors who have passed the licensing exam, and have worked full-time in public health care sector for three years, the MCHK has since last August shortened the period of assessment from six months to two days. Besides four colleges of HKAM, namely emergency medicine, family medicine, and internal medicine and pediatrics have agreed to admit non-locally trained doctors with qualification at the pre-intermediate level for a continuation of their specialist training in Hong Kong on the premises 
that the specialist training opportunities for locally trained doctors will not be compromised. The HA has updated the recruitment requirements for non-locally trained doctors with limited registration in those specialties since April this year. We expect these measures will attract more eligible non-locally trained doctors, particularly those who are Hong Kong people to serve in our public healthcare sector through limited registration, thus alleviating the manpower shortage problem. The government will consider the effectiveness of the above measures as well as the views of the relevant institution and stakeholders in the healthcare sector before deciding on the way forward. Two, in 2019-20, there was a cumulative shortfall of around 260 doctors and the attrition rate of 5.4% or 322 full-time doctors are in equivalent in the hospital authority. The HA is very concerned about the manpower of doctors in public hospitals and will continue to undertake measures to increase and retain manpower. In addition to increasing the number of resident trainee posts, the HA will strive to recruit more full-time and part-time doctors, increase promotion opportunities and enhance training, and continue to recruit non-locally trained doctors to serve in public hospitals under limited registration so as to relieve the work pressure on frontline doctors and improve their working environment. Besides, the HA will continue with the special retired and rehire scheme to rehire suitable serving doctors upon their retirement at normal retirement age or leaving the service upon completion of contract. Three, with the commencement of the Medical Registration Amendment 2018, the validity period and the renewal period of limited registration have extended from not one exceeding one year to not exceeding three years. The AG has taken this opportunity to review and enhance the limited registration scheme in different aspects with the aim to attracting more non-locally trained doctors to practice in Hong Kong. The relevant measures including extending the scheme from April 2019 to cover all specialty of the rank of resident and recruiting more non-locally trained specialists at the rank of associate consultant in specialties where the shortage of specialists is more serious. Moreover, in order to increase the promotion opportunities for non-locally trained doctors, those at the rank of resident with five or more years of post-specialist qualifications clinical experience in public hospitals will have the chance to be promoted to the rank of associate consultant. With the implementation of enhancement measures, the number of non-locally trained doctors recruited by HA has increased. As of May this year, there are 25 non-locally trained doctors working at HA hospitals until limited registration. Job applications from non-locally trained doctors are still received under the scheme. As usual, the HA will assess the qualifications and experience of the applicants in accordance with the mechanism and arrange interviews for the suitable candidates. For those who are considered suitable for appointment, the HA will submit their limited registration applications to the MCHK in batches according to their intended date of reporting for duty in Hong Kong. Four non-locally trained doctors whose application for a limited registration were earlier approved by MCHK will be appointed for duty within this year. The HA has submitted another three applications for non-locally trained doctors to the MCHK in May this year. The HA will continue to recruit non-locally trained doctors by way of limited registration and keep reviewing and monitoring the overall manpower situation. Thank you, President. Dr. Chang. President, well, from the Secretary's reply, we heard that the Secretary have been very creative on how to boost the number of overseas trained doctors. Well, as our idea, the secretary worried that it will be controversial. Thus, 
uh, they failed to conduct consultation. As for my three questions, the second part, we asked the secretary, so what are the uh, justifications of our uh, amendment but would not hear from the MHP? Well, secretary, I understand your intention. However, we should be people-centric. We should stand with the public. Well, we've actually lost 322 doctors. That's a very high attrition rate. And all of them are experienced doctors. And we still have a shortfall of 260. So these two combine 582 in total. Well, just now the secretary replied they would like to uh, at more HKAM specialist training places. Well, currently, only limited emergency medicine, family medicine, internal medicine, and pediatrics. And for the um, optometry and orthodontics and the obstetrician, and yet you're willing to add more training places. What's the reason for that? I continue to uh, lobby the uh, specialists. Of the four specialty I mentioned, there we have a have agreement in which they will admit non locally trained doctors with free intermediate level qualifications for continue their specialist training. Well currently in HA while they're admitting OCS trained doctor with limited registration, they also must start their specialist training to a certain level. Well they complete their first three years. Well as, as accepted by the most specialties, we hope to enhance the appeal to advance the specialist training earlier. Well, some of the d doctors have yet to finish their first three years of specialist training, and yet they already have started maybe a one or two years into their specialist training. And for these type of doctors, the four specialties are willing to admit them for ch continued training. For Dr. Chang, well, internal medicine cover lots of areas, and a lot of the chronic illnesses will fall under inside medicine. And if the the internal medicine would actually, well, of course, is predicated that the opportunities for local doctors are not compromised, and those with free intermediate level qualifications, overseas doctors, will be of great help. That's why on the uh, multi-party platform, which with the MCHK, HKAM, the Hong Kong Medical Association, the Hospital Authority, and the two medical schools, we we'll kind of come up with solutions. Our aim is to boost the number of non-locally trained doctors to applying to work in Hong Kong. So we we'll try to examine each area. Besides those already acquired specialist accreditation, well, the number it's not really that much. Even though the doctors could work in Hong Kong, that could be a real a tremendous help to Hong Kong. Well, we have done a lot of promotion overseas, for example, in London as well, Australia. We heard a lot of doctors and medical students, they uh, gave us an overall picture. Uh, we can uh, and admit them before they take their first specialty exam that the four colleges are already willing to admit those. So I hope that we can well, uh, increase the number of applicants in this case. Dr. Pia Chen. Thank you, President. When the Hong Kong president are f doctors are fighting the epidemic together, well, the Dr. Ang Cheng's question seems to be a step at the back. Well, Secretary, uh, your reply doesn't give the full picture. Well, each July, there are hundreds of doctors that could uh, replenish the attrition. However, you only s give half the picture. In Hong Kong, there are 23. That's the fresh uh, statistics. 34, 3,400 
non-locally trained doctors. We welcome qualified overseas doctors working in Hong Kong. There are actually three, over 3,000 here. And for those limited registration, we not need to sit for exams. And there's, uh, we couldn't verify the qualifications. It's really a back door of the registration system. And most of the registr limited registration doctors are not willing to work in HA, but prefer working in DH and the universities. So, Secretary, you only quote the HA figures. Can you tell us how many limited registered doctors will go to universities and unis and other places? Secretary N. Chang, what's your question? I would like Dr. Chang to clarify. What do you mean a step in the back? This is a Q&A, not the time for clarified. I hope you can elaborate what you mean by that. For us to try to move amendment bill to hire doctors to split the workload. Dr. Chang, please sit down. Secretary. Thank you, President. First, I'd like to thank Mr. Chan's, Dr. Chang's question. The doctor's statistic I quoted were provided by HA. And Mr. J Dr. Chen is correct. Each year we'll have uh, hundreds of fresh graduates put into service. On one hand, they just started their accreditation process. Well, I suppose more manpower is always good. And on the other hand, there are still be a wastage. So the figures are pretty much in flux. As for the number requested by Dr. Chen, as of the May of 2020, we have 25 doctors with limited registration employed by the HA. Indeed, there are four limited registration doctors in a DH. As for uh, where the limited registration doctors work in, 25% in HA, four in plus four altogether in DH and seven doctors have passed the licensing exam and get a full registration. And six of those, well, six or seven, choose to stay in public hospital. Only one doctor uh, uh, chose private practice, and four doctors have chose to work at the two medical schools. Looking at the figures, you can see a, a, a huge proportion of those choose to serve in HA hospitals. While we're promoting the program overseas, we are showing a promotional clips in which this uh, overseas doctor have uh, give their own testimony. And I will talk about experience and the experience working in Hong Kong. And so that um, they are very committed and always uh, dedicated to work in the public sector. Dr. Helena Wong. President, even though I have no idea what Dr. Chen meant by step at the back, uh, for Dr. N. Chang to raise this question, uh, I have very mixed feelings for that because the pro establishment camp members were urged to punish the healthcare professionals who, uh, who went on strike for order closure and refused to approved the funding for the training facilities for the two medical schools. And now you claim there's a shortage of doctors. The establishment could give a clean account and do some hard thinking themselves. As for the recruiting of OCs trained doctors to work in Hong Kong Public Hospital under limited registration, we support this measure. Well, currently we only have 25 non-locally trained doctors to work in HA hospitals. So, Secretary, do you have a target that, do we have an annual target of recruiting a certain number of OCs trained doctors to work in HA? If we don't have a target, so these 25 are very few because the attrition rate is 322. For you to recruit 25, there's no one that you can actually fill in the gap. So Dr. Chen claims that we have the local graduates 
Well, we'll talk about specialist training here as opposed to local fresh graduates. So, secretary, what measures do you have? Well, the measures you outlined are not effective because you so far only recruited 25. Thus, you need more effective measures. For example, besides promotion opportunities, and also consider other measures to let the limited registration doctors may be working for some years in the public hospital. If they perform well, you can allow them to change to full registration doctors. If you don't have any new tricks or new incentives, the number will stay at the 20s. There's no one who can able to uh, alleviate the doctor shortage in the public health care system because we allocated over 200 billion for the 10 year hospital development plan. So, where do we find a hardware like manpower? Thank you, Dr. Wang's question. The doctor shortage is taken seriously by the government. So we are not just relying on the limited registration scheme. That's only one of the measure. We're taking the multi-pronged approach. Besides uh, that boosting the number of uh, medical school places, the hospital authority, according to Dr. Wang, does for we also have a special retire and we and rehire scheme for specialists which we support the HA so that more experienced veteran doctors can serve the HA and train the next generation of specialists. The special scheme not just cover uh, doctors but also nurses and other LAI health professionals and other supporting staff. And so that uh, we can also uh, boost manpower for the entire healthcare profession. Besides this, you're also um, improving the promotion of prospects. Well, in order to attract uh, manpower, or according to Dr. Wang, non locally registered doctors to practice in Hong Kong, besides the four specialties, can agree to. Uh, admit non-local doctors at pre-intermediate level. We also, if they serve for five years or so, also as they obtain the specialist accreditation, they can be promoted to the rank of associate consultant. So we have actually a boost the resources to on implement that. As for the 25 OCs doctors, so these are, are the figures the doctors currently working in the HA. As for the May of 2020, the MCHK had approved uh, 61 applications. Well, while recruiting these doctors, well, in the process, some though <coughs> We're not able to report the duty right after approval, as we know that there will be a more coming in the pipeline. But well, last year's social incidents have also uh, slowed down our recruitment progress. So uh, we will continue with the recruitment drive. Government bills. <laughs> 